everyone except those who fly the mission. Then you take things step by step. This is Gemini Control, Houston. About two minutes ago, Neil Armstrong called in over to Nana Reeve, and he was able to confirm at that time that radar lock had been established. Roger, do you have solid radar lock on with the Agena? Over. That's affirmative. We have solid radar lock. Uh, just a second, I'll give you our current range. Roger, thank you. Sounds good. Uh, we're indicating 158 miles range and elevation of about 4 degrees. After radar lock-on, the crew will circularize their orbit inside that of the target vehicle. Meantime, the ground does not sit still, idly waiting for something to happen. Recovery forces are constantly shifting in response to the orbit of the spacecraft, changing station according to a detailed recovery plan. The USS Cochrane, a destroyer in the mid-Pacific, takes position for a 4-4 recovery that is, recovery in the fourth revolution in Zone 4. Zone 3 will be the planned landing zone for the next three revolutions, for 5, 6, and 7. After that, Gemini 8 will not be over a planned landing area again until the tenth revolution. Then it passes over the eastern Atlantic zone. If an emergency occurs in the eighth or ninth revolution, the spacecraft will land in a contingency area, Recovery is supported there by aircraft and available commercial shipping. But right now, much of this seems academic. The crew has other business. Okay, we've got a visual on the Agena at 76 miles. Roger, understand. Visual, Agena, 76 miles. Hello, uh, Houston. This is Gemini 8. Uh, we're stationed keeping on the Agena at about 150 feet. Way to go, partner. You've done it, boy. You've done a good job. Boy, look at that sucker. That's beautiful. See the dipole? Do I ever? I see everything for that color. Man, that's great. Man, that is really slick. A bit of all right. Okay, the first thing we really have to do, platform parallelism, 650 to 710. And they're giving us the SPC loaded jaw maneuver. It looks like that nominal time. So they're going to give you that time. I'll check your old status display for you. I bet those Lockheed guys are just jumping up and down. The S10 is on. Yeah. Okay. We are looking at the left or command pilot's window as the station keeping exercise with Agena begins. Gemini 8 had no difficulty in maneuvering in the vicinity of the Agena. The onboard film, as in past flights, was at six frames per second and is being projected at four times that speed. After station keeping for 35 minutes, command pilot Armstrong begins to move in closer to Agena, preparing his final docking approach. Both vehicles are traveling at approximately 17,500 miles per hour. We are looking at the target docking adapter end of the Agena. The command pilot makes a docking approach by applying very small thrust increases to Gemini 8. The maximum velocity difference between the two vehicles at docking will be about one foot per second. When the command pilot is about two feet from the Agena, he will pause until he gets a go from the Rose Knot Victor. The double check has been completed. Okay, Jimmy 8, uh, we have TM solid. You're looking good on the ground. Go ahead and dock. I think we're going to hold off this SPC thing until he does get docked. Okay, go ahead with your memory compare. Roger. Let us know what you get out of that. That was it. Two vehicles docked for the first time in space. Shortly after docking, the crew was slightly surprised when Jim Lovell, the spacecraft communicator, checked in with this caution. Go ahead. Uh, Roger, 8 to reading you loud and clear. I had some uh, information for you. Uh, ready to copy? Stand by. What kind of information is it? 
if you run into trouble and the uh, the attitude control system of Eugenia goes wild, just send in command 400 to turn it off and take control with the spacecraft. Did you uh, copy that? It was a routine check. You punch 400 into the onboard computer. This automatically turns off the attitude control system of the Agena. If the problem is Agena control, that ends it. Minutes later, Gemini 8 passed out of communications range beyond the island of Madagascar. The crew was preparing to begin a series of docking exercises. And the Mason was between stations. It had left 5-3 and was headed for a 6-3 recovery zone. Since we were in the fifth revolution, the retrofire experts were routinely updating their retrofire times. These are usually planned for six revolutions ahead and stored in the onboard computer. It was about this time that Jim Lovell almost qualified as the space prophet of the year. For seven hours after liftoff and 27 minutes of normal docking, an excessive yaw and roll motion occurred. The crew punched up 400, but the trouble was not in the Agena. Unable to find an immediate answer, Mr. Armstrong undocked. The roll rate continued to build up, reaching about one revolution per second. Struggling to regain control, Mr. Armstrong was forced to fire the re-entry thrusters and gradually reasserted control over the spacecraft. Neither crewman experienced any loss of orientation. Gemini never approached a critical structural strain. Once the re-entry thrusters are fired, there is the possibility of fuel leakage in orbit, leaking of fuel essential for re-entry. The flight had been highly successful through 27 minutes of docking, but final action rests squarely on the shoulders of this man, the flight director. A decision came quickly. Fuel readings were too low. Abort. That was the first decision. Others follow. Where do we recover? A stream of facts flow into Flight Director Hodges' console. Exact orbital position. Weather in the Pacific. Available daylight in recovery zones. And the whereabouts of the USS Mason. A destroyer which had repetitiously practiced picking up a boilerplate model of Gemini in the waters of the Pacific came into its own. Millions of people suddenly learned that it existed. With Gemini stabilized in flight, there were several advantages to delaying re-entry for another orbit. The retrofire officer would have an exact reading on retrofire times, and the crew could prepare for re-entry, and aircraft could be on station at splashdown. This is the way it would be. The NASA coordinator leans over toward the DOD console. We want to recover in 7-3. The DOD manager immediately punches the button, which puts him in contact with Pacific Recovery Control, Hawaii. Hawaii alerts the captain of the Mason. He swings around and heads for 7-3, making 30 knots. Search aircraft scramble from Okinawa. They will be over the predicted landing point 10 minutes before the spacecraft splashes down. As Gemini 8 begins its seventh and final revolution, weather is excellent in the splashdown area. The crew is busy. The command pilot has time for only this brief reflection. I'd like to argue with them about going home, but I don't know how we can. That was all. Gemini 8 sweeps past Ascension Island. Retrofire will come up over Kano, Nigeria. Air-to-ground communications are broken, but the rockets fire right on the nose. The crew begins their descent through the atmosphere. This is the view they will see for a long time the high peaks of the Himalayas. After these forbidding mountains, the sweep of the Pacific will look friendly and hospitable. Waiting for Gemini 8 are rescue aircraft circling in the landing area, ready to pick up an electronic signal from the spacecraft. Two aircraft from Okinawa were originally assigned here, but five others were quickly alerted and added to the recovery team. When Gemini 8 is only three miles away, a C-54 catches sight of it on the main landing parachute. After that, landing is almost routine, and Gemini 8 landed within two miles of the predicted impact point. The first pararescue swimmer in the water is Airman First Class Neal. Airman Neal is a veteran of combat rescue work and a good man to have on your side.
He was quickly followed by two other rescue swimmers. It was early afternoon in the Pacific, but almost 11 o'clock at night in the Atlantic where the USS Boxer had waited. The Mason, three hours away at splashdown, reached the area at 3.17 p.m. local time. Crew and spacecraft, both in good shape, were soon aboard. Within 72 hours, NASA scientists would pin down the source of trouble. A short circuit in the wiring of the number eight yaw thruster had caused it to fire erratically. The possibility of this failure recurring is slight, but a master switch has now been added to the Gemini spacecraft. The crew can throw this switch and cut off all power to the attitude thrusters in any future flight. Once the difficulty was corrected, we could take time out to realize that Gemini 8 had brought us closer to lunar exploration by demonstrating the first successful dock in space. Gemini 8 also gave many of us our first look at men like the three young rescue swimmers, Airman Neal and Moore and Staff Sergeant Hewitt, as well as the captain and crew of the Mason. Men who are there in every flight, on remote stations, doing their duty and doing it well. It was these men who sighted Gemini 8 on the parachute and took the crew and spacecraft safely aboard the Mason. At that point, we knew that the long months of training and the many simulations and the close interplay between NASA and the Department of Defense were sound. The mission is ended. The control room is empty, but it will soon fill up again as simulations begin for the next flight. We had achieved our first docking in space. We experienced our first orbital abort. In both cases, Gemini 8 came through with flying colors. <laughs>